how do you select your treatment for patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma? Well, the first step is to assess your patient. The second one is to know what are the regimen currently approved and available. The third one would be what are the features that would guide me towards one or the other of the two strategies available. Then it will be what's the workup and ultimately how do you start? As a medical oncologist, when you see a patient in clinic with renal cell carcinoma, you ask to ask yourself several questions. First one is, is it a clear cell RCC, that the most common histology feature, or is it a non-clear cell tumor? I won't uh, touch on these today. The second one is, how fit is your patient and how much the patient needs systemic therapy? Meaning, do we see a clear increase in metastatic sites? Therefore, assessing the kinetic of the tumor and not an oligometastatic tumor that would maybe require only focal three treatment. Now let's consider a patient that has metastatic spread, that is a clear cell RCC. You need to assess the IMDC classification. That's a prognostic tool, but it is also important because it helps us to know what are the options that are available in terms of systemic treatment. So the IMDC classification is very easy to perform. It only requires a physical assessment, performance status, is my patient highly symptomatic or not? to know the history of the disease, is it synchronous or asynchronous metastatic disease progression requiring systemic treatment more than one year or not? Because if it's more than one year, it means the kinetic of the tumor is slower. And lastly, four biological features, anemia, high platelets, thrombocytosis, high neutrophils, inflammatory syndromes, and hypercalcemia. And if your patient has none of those six factors, it's a good prognostic patient. If your patient has one or two of those six factors, it's an intermediate risk patient. And if the patient has three or more, it's a poor prognostic patient. That's the IMDC classification. Why is it important? Because it will impact the treatment that is available to treat the patient. In 2022, what are the options available to treat our patient? We have two different standards of treatment. One of them is what we call immune checkpoint combination, namely nivolumab plus ipilimumab, so dual immune checkpoint inhibition, that is available for patients with IMDC, intermediate and poor. That accounts for about 80% of our patient population. The second standard is a combination of one immune checkpoint inhibitor plus a VGF targeted therapy. So those therapies that we've been using as single agent, but we combine with immune checkpoint. And so there are different regimens that are approved and reimbursed across the world that are dual, one immune checkpoint inhibitor, one VGF TKI, namely axitinib plus pembrolizumab, lenvatinib plus pembrolizumab, cabozantinib plus nivolumab, and axitinib plus avilumab. So those four regimens have demonstrated a PFS benefit over sunitinib in the past. Three of them has demonstrated overall survival benefit against sunitinib. So these are standard treatments that are available. So either doublet IO or IO VGFTKI, these are the two standards available. Given that we have two different approaches that are available, bear in mind that IO IO is only for intermediate and poor, while IOTKI is for any IMD series group, poor, intermediate, and good risk patient, you have to choose between the two standards that are available. So what you will be taking into consideration is patient status, patient comorbidities, patient past medical histories, and you will be also taking into consideration the clinical features of your tumor. We mentioned the inflammatory status of your patient, for instance, we have to have checked the absence of pre-existing autoimmune disease that would prevent you from immune checkpoint inhibition use or would require specific assessment. Because in one of the regimen you are using VGFTKI, you also have the past medical history with regard to cardiovascular history. If your patient eligible for VGFTKI, if your patient has any wound healing issue, for instance, that would prevent you from VGFTKI or high blood pressure that would not be properly monitored. So once you have checked the medical history, once you have checked the inflammatory status of your patient, 
you take into consideration is your patient highly symptomatic or not of the disease. Why is that? Because with IOIO approach, we know the long-term benefit in terms of overall survival. We know the response rate is about 42%. With IOTKI approach, the response rate is up to 60, almost 70% for some of those regimen. And therefore, although there is the same long-term benefit, in a patient that is highly symptomatic, you want to seek for response rate. So you may pick a VGFTKI plus IO strategy. In a patient who is not symptomatic, you may want to go for the IO-IO strategy. Both of them have demonstrated overall survival benefits. So in two cases, you are increasing the benefit when compared to prior VGFTKI. Your initial workup will be CT imaging. And I think when you start first-line therapy, it's important to have a brain CT or MRI being performed to rule out a brain metastasis. This would require stereotactic radiation therapy or surgery, given that our systemic treatment are not that efficient in the brain, so you want to go for focal therapy. So baseline imaging, you want a proper blood work. We have to have in mind that this blood work need to check for pre-existing autoimmune disorder or thyroid disorder, that needs to be checked. You need to check uh, what is the, uh, like for instance, the uh, glucose level of your patient, any diabetes that would not have been diagnosed. All these items need to be properly uh, monitored. And if you're going for a VGFTKI, you need a proper cardiac uh, workup, including EKG, including ultrasound echography, so that you have a, an assessment of the function of the ventricular ejection. Now, let's start the treatment. You have decided the strategy between IOIO and IOTKI. First step is to inform the patient. We never over-inform our patients. So inform the patient. So technically, let's take the example of IOIO. Nivolumab plus ipilimumab. Explain to your patient that the patient will receive four cycles every three weeks of the two drugs until getting into the maintenance phase of nivolumab a single agent. I think it's important here to stress to the patient and the family that those first six months will be the one where the occurrence of immune-related side effects may happen. And therefore, any new symptoms should trigger their attention and they should reach out to you or your nurse to make, aware, to make you aware of that and, and make sure that we are not missing an immune-related adverse event that required specific management. With VGFTKI IO strategy, Many oncologists are very, very familiar with the VGFTKI component, the high blood pressure, mucitis, diarrhea, handphone syndromes, all those uh, different side effects needs to be um, uh, explained to the patient. And you know, like you may have a specific requirement like cream or a mouthwash or a specific low pyramid use for diarrhea that you want to be able to uh, uh, properly explain to your patient so that he handles with you properly the side effects. But you also want to highlight the concomitant use of the immune checkpoint inhibitor. That could be every two weeks or every three weeks, depending on the drug you use. And therefore, the patient is still at risk of immune adverse event. So make your patient aware of those unlikely to happen, but still existing immune-related adverse events. And overall, it's important to monitor your patient at each visit to capture those side effects, perform the blood draw, making sure that you don't have uh, non-symptomatic biological toxicity. I'm thinking about liver toxicity that could occur. And of course, explain to the patient that you will be performing imaging, CT scan, to assess the response on a regular basis. Depending on your regimen, it could be every eight weeks or every 12 weeks. Every 12 weeks is the most common situation, except if you have clinical signs that require to prompt the follow-up. <laughs>